Um, well, it's wonderful to be here, to have this opportunity. Um, and I'm going to start by telling you the story of how my path and Ken's path crossed. And that will involve telling you a little bit about myself. So I grew up in rural Kansas, the youngest of five Catholic kids. And although I did really well at school, I was, not, I was raised essentially to become a full-time mother and wife, not to have a career. And as a child, I experienced a close and supportive relationship with God. And as a teen, I went to summer running camps led by evangelical Christians and to a lot of Catholic retreats. And uh, as a college student at Rice University, I double majored in religious studies and psychology, along with being a pre-med, because Rice, of course, is a science and engineering school. And my parents wanted me to become a doctor, so I wasn't going to get married. So um, by age 20, though, I felt, I re I f I felt called to be a Catholic priest. This was a problem. <laughs> so by 23, I decided to pursue a PhD in clinical psychology and study the psychology of religion. Lo and behold, in 1985, I could not find a non-sectarian university to get a PhD in clinical psychology and study religion. So I went to the University of Houston and specialized in couples and family research. And then at 30, I got a job at BGSU, which was also unexpected. And one of the most fortuitous events of my life, some might say miraculous, is that when I opened my door to my office, I noticed that next to my door was a sign that said Ken Pargament. And he asked me to edit or uh, review his book on religious coping. And I thought, oh, this is my chance to show that I can keep up. And I wrote, in my naivety, 12 single space pages of critique. <laughs> Fortunately, Ken is a wonderful human being. I got tenured anyway. And uh, we formed a collaborative bond that has um, been wonderful for the last 23 years. So um, I've had the pleasure and the joy of working with him to try to integrate both personally, and he's a great confidant, and professionally. My fascination with uh, interpersonal psychology, family psychology, relationships. Um, along with the psychology of religion and spirituality. And because of my life journey, I view myself as a scientist and a clinician who deeply appreciates the power religion has, for better and worse, for significant relationships, for dating, for married and cohabiting couples, for parents and their bonds with their infants, their children, their teens, their college-aged kids who've done a lot of that work, and then for adult children and their aging parents, and for friendships, Allie, where are you? Um, and for colleagues in the workplace. And the word I use for this intersection is rela relational spirituality. Now, relational spirituality encompasses the ways that people turn to religion and spirituality to help them create, sustain, and transform relationships over the lifespan. That's kind of boring, isn't it? So to use Ken's wonderful language, it says, when the search for the sacred is united with the search for relationships. Now, um, I'm passionate about trying to draw more attention to this intersection because above all else, what I learned at Rice is that scientists are supposed to pay attention to empirical reality. And the reality is that faith remains a powerful force that can bind people together in loving, life-giving relationships or can pull them into destructive, painful, interpersonal conflicts at home in the public sphere, as I anticipate we may see at the Republican Convention, into wars. So I just think it's really important to understand this intersection better. And even if people may be disengaging from organized religion, still somewhere, at least in the United States, around 89, 85 percent of people feel that they have some sort of connection with a higher power or transcendent reality. And that may shape how they relate to human beings. 
So um, I'm going to illustrate some scientific findings from uh, about relational spirituality. I'm going to start with some basic findings and um, about what we know about faith and family relationships, and then I'm going to focus on couples' relationships to try to illustrate how we could go much deeper, and that's the theme with Ken, is to go deeper to understand what's going on. And I'm going to for sure have time to talk about sacred conversations and how those work for people, and then hopefully can get to uh, our research on sacred connections or the sanctity of unions. So along the way, I'm going to highlight some mystery areas that we still have a lot of room, a lot of to explore. And I'm going to get started with the, uh, I'm going to, well, I guess I've started, but now let's, I'm going to ask you a question that I love to start with. And the, uh, I want to ask, you know, some of you have always do, already done this, so. But what, what comes to your mind, first word, when I ask you, what is the opposite of losing? Winning. You're an American, right? <laughs> Winning. So um, in our current American culture at least, the prevalent my message is that the main goal of life is to win in a fierce competition for the survival of the fittest. Indeed, for many, the ultimate goal in life is to outwit, outlast, outplay. To come out on top, to earn the most money, to attract the most desirable mate, to bear and real ch raise children who will go to elite universities, not BGSU. Relationships boil down to nothing more, nothing less than social transactions to increase my odds of winning. What do I need to do? What a cost-benefit analysis of what I can get from you to get me ahead so I win. Therapy clients are reduced to billable hours. Research colleagues are reduced to business allies to win grants. College students are reduced to tuition credit hours. Lay people are reduced to consumers to pr purchase copywritten materials. University faculty and staff are reduced to interchangeable widgets in someone else's economic model. And much of the social science research on religion and spirituality reflects this individual American orientation Sociologists and psychologists have mostly focused on the spirituality of me. What can it, faith do for me to make me happier, me healthier? But read the question again. What is the opposite of losing? What's another answer? Finding. For many people, the opposite of losing is finding, not winning. The ultimate destination in life is to find, to form and maintain connections with people, to give and receive love. And so, so for me, relational spirituality is important because it speaks to way, uh, what the ways faith can help and harm that search and the way that our relationships feed back into our individual journeys and shape our faith communities. It's really the science of the spirituality of us. And then the question becomes, well, does this really matter in our sec increasingly secularized world? Hmm. Well, I'll start by arguing that diverse religious traditions teach that the ultimate desired destination is to form a sense of connections with others through the lifespan. Uh, to recognize connectedness of all of life, to be connected to some sort of transcendent reality, to others, to yourself. And, in f you know, one classic Christian definition of sin is separation from God, self, and others. And diverse religious teaching, progressive and conservative, socially conservative and progressive, cover every aspect of coupling and uncoupling, conceiving and child rearing, letting go and caring for and letting go for lo loved ones. So I remember he's saying, uh, we hatch them, match them, and dispatch them, <laughs> right? That's what we do, religion. And th it's at those points of connected and disconnecting that religion really speaks. So let's look at some basic findings of what we know about relational spirituality. And the first and most fundamental, rather sad fact, 
is a simple one. It's that this is a topic social scientists have largely avoided. If you look for the 30 years between 1980 and 2009, which I obsessively did, I found 131 studies out of about 11,000 studies on marriage and divorce where the researchers had looked at, uh, specifically asked a hypothesis about religion or spirituality. So that's about 1% or less. And um, the research on parenting is even more scarce. Okay. But we do know some things from that literature. And to help you understand what we know, I'm going to ask you these three questions. How often do you attend religious services? Uh, what's your religious affiliation? And how important is religion or spirituality to you in your daily life? Got your answers? So if I was going to interview you, how much would I know about whether faith shapes um, who you decided to marry, when you decided to have sex, how you decided to parent? How much would those questions tell me? Well, about 70 to 85 percent of those 131 studies use those three questions. Okay, so based on those questions, what do we know about religion, spirituality, and faith, and I mean family life? We know that religion seems to help many people sustain loving family relationships. And I don't have time to go into all the details, but you, I promise you I can tell you where you can go read the long paper about it. Um, we know that uh, with couples who attend services more often and view religion as more important, uh, people report more marital satisfaction, more satisfaction with same-sex relationships, and more satisfaction with cohabiting relationships. We know that, that uh, individuals in these relationships, or marriages at least, are less likely to divorce, less likely to have extramarital affairs, and less likely to engage in domestic violence. When it comes to parenting, we know that married parents and single mothers who attend services more or view religion as important engage in more positive parenting, have a less risk of child abuse, talk about corporal punishment later, and better uh, parent-adolescent relationships. The corporal punishment link spanking only holds, we think, for con the conservative for Christians. So let's delve deeper, though. Like, what's really going on here? That's what's motivated me with my career, and I've been lucky enough to go there. Uh, you know, are there specific spiritual practices or the activities that people can do together that help their relationships. Um, you know, do you, if you pray more or do you attend more services with your other people or talking about your spiritual journeys, does it matter? Does it help? And I'm going to so show you that yes, sacred conversations seem to help a lot. And I'll show you some findings about spiritual intimacy. And then the second question, are there spiritual beliefs that you can have about relationships that help? Well, are you more likely to invest in a union you view as sacred and babies who are divine gifts? Or if you feel called um, spiritually to be a parent, does that help? And I'll show you, hopefully, if I get to it, that yes, it does seem to help. Now, as a caveat before I move on, I'll mention that we, Ken and I, have intentionally designed our concepts and measures to be inclusive of people whose spiritual journeys take place within and outside the context of organized religion. And this is especially important when it comes to faith and family relationships. Because some families may reject some or all religious institutions because they're non-traditional, especially. And some religious institutions may reject some families. But no other social institutions designed explicitly to foster people's search for the sacred as they search for relationships. And um, we are trying to come up with concepts and ideas that are inclusive of everybody, inside and outside of religion, organized religion. So spiritual intimacy is one of those concepts. And our question basically is, do sacred conversations help relationships? Do having sacred conversations help? <coughs> and so what do I mean by spiritual intimacy? Well, there's two parts of it. The first one is trust. It's openly disclosing your spiritual journey to another person. And the second part is opening li op openly listening to the other person's disclosures as you're having that conversation. 
And to give you a more concrete sense of what I'm talking about, I'll have you answer some of the questions we've had our research participants answer. So think about a relationship, a close relationship you have. It can be a spouse or a partner or my teenage son. It can be anybody. Do you feel safe being completely open and honest with that person, talking about your faith? Do you tend, or do you tend to keep your spiritual side private and separate from that person in that relationship? Do you try not to be judgmental or critical when the other person shares? Do you try to be supportive when they disclose their struggles or their questions? You got your answers? Oh, but what would the other person say? Hmm. That would be important, wouldn't it? So we've actually asked both people in the relationship, marriage, to answer these questions. How much do you share? Um, if we were asked the other person, how much do, would they agree that you share your relation, your spiritual struggles with, or uh, questions with them? Would they say that you disclose or you don't disclose your thoughts and feelings with them? Would they say you know how to listen when you talk uh, when you uh, when that you know how to listen when he or she talks about his spiritual needs and thoughts and feelings? Would they say that you're supportive when he or she reveals spiritual questions or struggles? So together, together those things form spiritual intimacy uh, the way we've studied it. And um, here, I'm going to show you some data now on the power of spiritual intimacy, which actually looks like empirically is even more powerful than sanctification. Um, in a study that we conducted that Templeton was kind enough to fund on 174 couples having their first baby together. And what we found is that greater spiritual intimacy predicted less negativity and more positivity by husbands and wives when they talked about their top three conflicts. Now, I'm going to tell you a few more details because I think this is the best study that's ever come out of our lab. And um, I'm actually particularly proud of it. Um, so this involved um, four teams of three raiders observing videotaped marital interactions when the couples were pregnant and then when the first baby was three, six, and 12 months old. So we went to their homes for two to three hours and camped out and el elicited all this data from them. And each coder then rated the videotapes on each spouse about their warmth, affection, and communication skills, and then conversely, how negative were they? Their defensiveness, their criticism, their hostility. Now, uh, why are the findings so impressive that we got? Well, first of all, we asked both people to report on spiritual intimacy. We just didn't take one person's word about how good they were at it or how much they did it. Secondly, we jumped over the self-report actual behavior barrier. So we actually observed the couple's behavior to see with what they reported about spirituality mattered. And that's a huge criticism in the literature is that most of the research is based on what I say about religion and spirituality and then what I say about my psychological well-being or how I treat other people. And jumping over that barrier is very hard. But it's not only hard in our, in, it's hard for everybody and not that many family psychologists report this data. It's hard for everybody to jump the self-report, observe behavior barrier. And then we use this very, very sophisticated statistical analyses. I'm not even going to try to go into that, but trust me when I say that we controlled for everything that doesn't change about you over time and pulled it out to see whether or not spiritual intimacy really mattered. And it's not just how smart you are, or how well you can talk, or how articulate you are. Our findings apply to truck drivers as well as to the academics who are in our studies. And what we know now, I think, even though it's only one study, it's really strong stuff, um, is that spiritual intimacy motivates couples to treat each other better and avoid hurting each other. Um, and there are several studies that a uh, former grad student of ours, Gina Brailsford, has done with college students and parents, and they've, she's gotten some similar results in terms of predicting uh, that spiritual disclosure, we only, al at that point, we're, so we're studying spiritual disclosure, not also empathy, uh, in terms of improving um, parent-college uh, student relationships. 
Now, our assumption with these findings is that people work harder to preserve and protect their bonds with other people with whom they can openly share their spiritual journeys, their deepest values, their core aspects of who they are and what they believe about the universe that can't be necessarily proven in our scientific world as factually true. And think about your own life. Like, who do you share this information with? And is that especially valuable, that relationship to you? And would it motivate you to not go negative, to preserve and protect that connection with another person? And then I guess I should just mention that two people don't have to agree or be the same. It gets confusing. You don't have to both be Protestants or both be Catholics or both be whatever denomination. Two atheists can have high spiritual intimacy. Any believer, uh, any, any pair of people could have high spiritual intimacy. And this leads me to what I'd like to know next, which is what fosters and inhibits spiritually intimate conversations. I'm suspecting technology is a culprit, but it's another conversation. And uh, in our work together, Ken and I have always tried to balance what helps with what harms. And so I'll mention that I've, I've framed so far spiritual conversations as being spiritually intimate. But there are other kinds of spiritual conversations one can have. What about spiritual one-upmanship? Um, I'm going to show you a cartoon to capture this, and then I'll talk a little bit about it. That's a spiritual conversation. So spiritual one-upmanship involves opening and lying with God or drawing upon religion and spirituality to reinforce one's position in conflicts with God. Now we initially called this theistic mediation, I mean theistic triangulation, and then I realized our, our, our items and the, the, the concept isn't restricted to pulling God into the middle. You can be a, not a, a, a non-theist and still be spiritually superior toward somebody. So an example of some questions are, I suggest in a conflict my view is spiritually superior to the other person, or I suggest God's on my side. Now this phenomenon is relatively rare because it's a form of interpersonal struggle, and struggles in general are relatively rare, but the more it happens, the more hostility there is. And if you've ever been in a, con a discussion like this, you know that. Um, and I think this is one of the reasons people avoid having spiritual conversations is because they don't want to get in one of these <laughs> conversations with other people. Um, so you'll see more hostility in spouses and with college students with spiritual one-upmanship. Okay, so now I'm going to switch gears and uh, share with you, um, uh, uh, switch gears from sacred conversations to sacred connections. And the question here is whether viewing a relationship as a spiritual connection helps. And to get started, I'll again have you answer some of the same questions we've asked our research participants to answer about the sanctity of their marriages. And um, we ask people to use their own word for God when they answer the question. And I'd like you to think about a relationship you have with a partner or a spouse. How would you answer these questions? You ready? God played a role in how I ended up being married or with my partner. I sense God's presence in my relationship with my spouse or my partner. Got it? Think about strongly disagree as a one, a neutral as a four, and seven is strongly agree. Got it? My marriage is sacred to me, or my relationship connects my partner and me to something greater than ourselves. Okay, so now I'm gonna about to show you some percentages that we got from our 174 couples in our transition to parenthood studies. Any guesses about what percentage of people might endorse these questions that agree or higher? Wild guesses?
Okay, the immediate question, the skeptical science says, well, what was your sample like? It must be some wacko sample. Fortunately, we live in Northwest Ohio. No, indeed, we are a cross-section of the country. Demographically, we are not a wacko sample. It's one of the benefits of working in this area of the country. We can gather samples locally, and they pretty much reflect the um, demographics of a cross-section of married couples with young children. And they aren't going to services more often than the average American couple either. So um, our scientific definition we've been working with since 1999 is that uh, process sanctification is a process through which aspects of life are perceived as having divine character and significance. So I showed you the items first because that's kind of abstract. And I showed you items that capture both the God-centered sanctity and non-theistic sanctity. So God-centered or theistic is believing that an aspect of life is a manifestation of one's images, beliefs, or experiences with God. And believe in sacred qualities apply to an aspect of life, including attributes of transcendence, ultimate value, purpose, and boundlessness. So we started this in uh, 1999. And since then, a lot of people have been doing a lot of research. And what we've found as in our study, the most recent one, is that felt love for spouse and satisfaction with marriage are connected with higher sanctity, as well as observed loving behaviors during videotaped interactions. And there have been about 21 studies now on the sanctity of uh, relationships, sexual relationships, and marital relationships. And in general, it looks like the more you look at your relationship through this sacred lens, the better off you are in terms of your sexual and marital functioning. I didn't have time to talk about the sanctity of sex. That's a great, fun topic to talk about. The quest mystery question is how much do people view non-traditional relationships as sacred? Uh, most of the research has been done on married heterosexuals. So does this apply to dating couples, cohabiting couples, same-sex unions, given that people are delaying marriage and fewer people are getting married at all? And then what about parents, single parents, adoptive parents, foster parents, grandparents? Most of the research, again, has been on married heterosexuals with biological children, and because the assumption's been that religion's only relevant to those people. And I uh, argue elsewhere that that is a potential, that's just not empirically known yet. We just haven't done studies on the non-traditional families. And the studies we have done show that that is a stereotype that that's not true, that faith doesn't matter to non-traditional families. And then what about other family ties? People get into a lot of long discussions about how to define religion or spirituality, but try f defining family in one sentence. A lot of pe uh, we got to do a study on the sanctity of pets. We really do. The uh, sanctity of our relationship with our pets. Um, and friendships and coworkers who are now our family. So that's a big mystery area I'd like to find out more about. We do have some hints that uh, uh, about non-cohabiting uh, couples. There's a recent study under review right now, actually, about 55% of Americans in a steady dating or cohabiting relationship agree that God's at the center of my relationship, and that's a national sample. And uh, the results were tied to higher satisfaction with the union, but not greater motivation to get married. Okay, now I have four minutes to try to talk about the dark side of sanctification. So we know that many people strive to sustain and create sacred bonds, but what happens when that goes awry? Um, so, um, uh, ample research suggests that highest re higher religious attendance is, like I said, tied to lower divorce and other problems, but people of faith are not immune to serious relationship problems. And furthermore, religious, more religiously involved people are more likely to sanctify their relationships. So that sets the stage for perceiving problems within the relationship as a desecration or a sacred loss. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, what's a sacred loss? It's perceiving an event as the loss of something that is or was once viewed as sacred. So you might answer these questions. Have you ever lost something you thought God wanted from you, uh, for you, say a marriage or a dating relationship? Have you ever lost something that gave you sacred meaning and is now uh, missing? 
a relationship with a colleague or um, maybe your, your, your son or your daughter you thought was that way and it got lost. About 75% of adults and 30% of children view their, divorce, their family's divorce as a sacred loss. What about desecration? You can perceive events like divorce or breakups or infidelity or a child having really serious behavior problems who won't cooperate as a violation of something that was or is viewed as sacred. So you can think about that kind of event as destroying something that was sacred or tearing something that you thought God wanted out of your life. And about 80% of adults and 30% of adult children view their family's divorce in this way. It's not a good thing. It predicts more depression and anger over time, more verbal hostility longitudinally between ex-spouses, and more spiritual struggles for the people who suffer these losses and desecrations. So viewing relationship problems in a negative light seems to intensify individual psychological and spiritual pain. It also intensifies their relationship problems. And so the last mystery question I'll mention today is how to help people who encounter these kinds of problems with relational spirituality. How to address the spiritual struggles. You know, I can imagine that if you're trying to get, you want to get married or you want to find a, a permanent union outside of marriage, that you can run into problems with sexual intimacy, when to have, to have sex, how to have it, wh what it means, infidelity, divorce. And then becoming or being a parent, infertility, adoption, child rearing, confusion, those are all potential questions of which we know nothing in terms of how faith plays a role. So if you would like more information, you can Google relational spirituality to find our website, and we've tried to lay it all out there in a more accessible way for people to explore and begin uh, to grapple with this um, intersection of faith and family. 30 minutes.